and Wabanaki peoples past and present. We acknowledge with honor and gratitude the land itself and the people who have stored it throughout the generations. Dan, can you switch the slides? Thank you. The Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire promotes awareness and appreciation of African American history and life in order to build more inclusive communities today. We're really excited about the series that we have, um, the Claiming Our Space. And we're, we're looking at, uh, I define white spaces as spaces where Blacks and people of color are marginalized, typically absent and are unexpected. We did uh, our first program looked at the landscape uh, around farming. Our second, one, second program looked at the intellectual landscape of uh, science fiction. And today we're really excited to be exploring the world of the soul. And I look forward to everyone participating in this conversation, um, in this deep, meaningful dialogue around race and care of the soul. Before we begin, just to set us in our mood and create the, um, the environment and the energy that um, we have, I'd like to invite Reverend Bob Thomas to just open us in song. When Israel was in Egypt land, let my people go. Oppressed so hard they could not stand, let my people go. Go down and Moses, way down in Egypt land. Tell old Pharaoh to let my people go. Thus saith the Lord, bold Moses said, let my people go. If not, I'll smite your firstborn dead. Let my people go. Go down, Moses, way down in Egypt land. Tell my privilege to introduce my colleague, the Reverend Lauren Smith, who is uh, a minister in the Unitarian Universalist Association. She uh, pastored uh, South Church in Portsmouth for eight years along with her husband. And now she is in a, an administrative uh, position with that denomination, 
Uh, she's the director of stewardship and development uh, for the UU Association, uh, job which began in February of 2019. So she's no longer new in that in that in that position. Uh, Reverend Lauren is a longtime Unitarian. It's actually ancestral deep for her. Uh, she, uh, her great great grandfather was born a free black person in North Carolina, became a member of First Parish in Cambridge, Massachusetts, after his family escaped the South. So without any more introductions, it is my honor indeed to present to you Reverend Lauren Smith. Thank you so much, Reverend Thompson. And it is uh, such a joy to be back here to see familiar faces. Um, and it's a privilege to be invited to moderate this conversation. One of the many joys of my time in ministry at South Church was the opportunity to get to know you, Jerry Ann, whoever you are, and um, just other wonderful folks. So it's, it's uh, a joy and a privilege to be back here and to be invited um, to help out in this way. Um, it's also very exciting to be in this conversation um, with Thomas Moore and Reginald Filburn. Thomas Moore, I have to return my notes, um, is, is well known. He is the author of Care of the Soul and 24 other books about bringing soul to personal life and culture, deepening spirituality, humanizing medicine, finding meaningful work, Imagining, imagining sexuality with soul and doing religion in a fresh way. In his youth, he was a Catholic monk and studied music composition. He has a PhD in religious studies from Syracuse University and was a university professor for a number of years. Um, he has a family, he travels and lectures and his family members are also deeply involved in spiritual approaches to the arts. His wife, help me with the pronunciation, Hari Kareen. Hari Kareen is an accomplished painter and teaches a course she's created on yoga and art. And his daughter Ajit is a musician and recording artist and spiritual teacher. His stepson Abraham is an architect focusing on design related to the social aspects of building. And that's near and dear to my heart, the ancestor that was mentioned, um, William Hazel, who was at Cambridge, was an architect and he, he um, that was part of his flourishing. Dr. Reginald Wilburn is also with us today and it's a joy to be with him as well. He's an associate professor of English at UNH, specializing in African-American literature and culture, Milton and intertextuality studies. He's the author of a monograph, Preaching the Gospel of Black Revolt, Appropriating Milton in Early African-American Literature, which sounds delicious to me. The monograph is the first work of literary criticism to theorize African-American subversive receptions of John Milton, England's epic poet of liberty. The book examines Miltonic pre presence in the works of diverse writers from Phyllis Wheatley and Frederick Douglass to Francis Harper, Anna Julia Carper, and Sutton Griggs. Um, uh, Professor Wilburn is a recipient of two UNH teaching awards, mentor students in the Office of Multicultural Student Affairs, and has sung the national anthem at several commencement uh, exercises. So we celebrate his artistry, his connection, his service, his scholarship, and his presence. Um, so we'll begin the day with uh, just an opening kind of statement from each of the three of us. Um, and I would like to offer as an introduction the words of June Jordan, one of my favorite thinkers and writers, um, sort of set inside some words of my own. Um, and I offer it uh, as a way of introduction to me, your convener, uh, and also because it raises themes that are present in the writing of Thomas More and the work of Reginald Wilburn. Themes like soul and intimacy, violence and power, love and the arts, connection, sexuality, and the place where personal soul intersects with the soul of society and the world. I look forward to exploring all of these things with you today. So this is actually the beginning of a sermon I preached at South Church. Um, 
in 2012. The late essayist June Jordan is one of my favorite thinkers, insightful, down to earth, and wickedly intelligent. Years ago, I had encountered an essay of hers called The Difficult Miracle of Black Poetry in America. It was about Phyllis Wheatley, the first published African-American poet, and it took up the dilemma raised by the psalmist. The wicked have carried us away to captivity and required of us a song. How can we sing our holy song in a strange land? The essay begins like this. It was not natural, and she was the first. Come from a country of many tongues, torn by rupture, by theft, by travel like mismatched clothing, packed down into the cargo of evil ships, sailing irreversible into slavery. Come to a country to be docile and dumb, to be big and breeding, to be turkey, horse, cow, to be cook, carpenter, plow, to be 5'6", 140 pounds in good condition and answering to the name of Tom or Mary. To live forcibly illiterate, forcibly itinerant, to live eyes lowered, head bowed. To be worked without rest, to be worked without pay, to be worked without thanks, to be worked day up to nightfall, to be three-fifths of a human being at best to be this valuable, this hated thing among strangers who purchased your life and cursed it unceasingly, to be a slave, to be a slave. Come to this country to be a slave and how should you sing? How could you belonging to no one but property to those despising the smiles of your soul, how could you dare to create yourself a poet? The girl who would become Phyllis Wheatley was brought to the United States from the shores of Africa and put up for auction at the tender age of seven. She was purchased by Susanna and John Wheatley and her first poem, which she wrote at the age of 14, was published in 1768. Phyllis was dropped as a child into a social structure systematically designed to annihilate black personhood, to then annihilate the soul of black people, stripped of her name, her family, her place, her language, and so much more, and yet she emerged an artist. This is the great and difficult miracle of her life. Jordan goes on, a poet can read, a poet can write, a poet is African in Africa or Irish in Ireland or French on the left bank of Paris or white in Wisconsin. A poet writes in her own language. A poet writes in her own people, her own history, her own vision, her own room, her own house where she sits at her own table quietly placing one word after another until she builds a line and a movement and an image and a meaning that somersaults all of these into the singing absolutely individual voice of the poet at liberty. A poet is somebody free. A poet is someone at home. How should there be black poets in America? It was not natural and she was the first. I've been captivated by this miracle and mystery for most of my life. The miracle of what Zora Neale Hurston called the secret of black song and laughter. Song and laughter that seemed to emerge out of the vibrant, whole, unbroken soul of black people against all odds, century after century. It is not an exaggeration to say that ultimately, this difficult miracle is my religion. The religion underneath my Unitarian Universalism and my personal practice of Buddhism and I'm, my deep love of, Christ, of liberal Christianity. Each of these traditions teaches in different ways that there is a wholeness and a freedom singing at the heart of everything to which each of us is heir. So I look forward to exploring some of these themes of opening, of individuality, of power and freedom, all of these wonderful things that are present in the work of the folks who are here to be in conversation. And I'd like to invite uh, Thomas to share his opening words. 
Thank you, Laura. That was beautiful. Thank you. Um, I thought I'd, I'd begin with, uh, uh, as you did, Lauren, with a, a quotation. Uh, this one from uh, Martin Luther King that has inspired me for a long time from his I Have a Dream speech. He said, let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. Again and again, we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. That has inspired me, obviously, because he used what in our family we call the S word, the soul word. And uh, I know that, you know, I have felt so identified with him and his wife because he was a theologian. I have my uh, degree from Syracuse in religious studies and, and one in theology and feel very close to, to him in that respect. Um, and also his wife Coretta was, uh, was studying music and was a musician and hoped to, they hoped, both hoped to become professors of music and theology, which are both two sides of me. So I identify with that uh, very much. And uh, I, I know that uh, the intelligence that, uh, that he brought to an awakening of awareness uh, came from his studies in theology. So uh, that's, that's where I come from. I come from the study of theology and religion, uh, not in a, now not in a traditional way, but uh, in a way that is very deep and for me, and I hope open, very open. And I, by the way, uh, Lauren, I'm often invited to Unitarian communities to speak because they know and I know that we have so much in common. Um, the other thing I wanted to say just to get going is about my own experience. My very first uh, teaching about soul was when I was probably about four years old. I grew up in an Irish Catholic family and uh, I'd go to church, Catholic church with them. And um, the priest would say that your soul is like a little piece of cotton, white cotton. And every time you do something bad, it got dirty. And it kept getting dirtier all the time. So I had a very uh, negative teaching, you might say, about the soul when I started out, but that's where I started. And I think today probably a lot of people think, uh, think morally about the soul rather than uh, the soul as a presence, as something that they can care for and bring out in their lives for their own joy. I certainly was not taught about the joy of the soul when I first started. Another thing I wanted to mention was that I grew up in Detroit. Uh, my dad was a, a plumbing instructor and a plumber. He started out as a plumber. And my grandfather and grandmother lived across the street from us in this working class neighborhood in a small house. My grandfather worked in a factory. He worked for the Dodge car company. So we didn't make much money. They had six children and my grandmother's sister and her husband and her son lived with them. And uh, they had a tenant to come in to help pay the rent. All those people in house with one bathroom and I think three bedrooms, well actually two bedrooms and an, an attic. And that's where I grew up. I spent about at least half of my life in that house with all these people. And I think that's where I learned a lot about soul because there was so much joy there. Even though there was constant fear of not having enough money to get along. There was always food and there was always people making things and people coming over and dancing and music. And I think that is really the essence of soul. It is soul is, is the joy of life and it often comes when you, when you don't have everything you need. There's something, there's an interesting relation between loss and soul. There's something about not having everything that, that let, leads you right into this more, deeper, more human soulful life. 
that was my experience of it. And, and I treasure that in my background. And every time, I'm since then I've become sort of an egghead, you know, a university professor and talk about soul in relation to the great philosophers. But I always keep in mind where I come from. And there's one more story I often tell that also is a story of soul. When I was four years old, uh, it was a habit in my family for me to go out to uh, spend a weekend or a Sunday with my grandfather, my father's father, and the family on a small lake outside of Detroit. And we'd go out in a rowboat and often go fishing. I don't remember much, but I remember little. And one Sunday, we went to a much bigger lake, Lake St. Clair, which was a big, rough lake with Canada on the other side. You couldn't see across the lake. And we went out in a boat, my grandfather and I, and we were out, out in the water for a while when suddenly I felt cold water coming up over my ankles and in my legs. And the next thing I know, I could see the boat overturned and everything that was in the boat was floating in the water. And my grandfather was picking me up and holding me on the back of the overturned boat. And I remember, I can still see all of these images are strong in my mind. And I remember him gasping for air and his arms holding me up on the back of this uh, overturned boat until people came by and, and got hold of us and picked us up. And I survived, my, but my grandfather didn't. He drowned in the water there. And my father and, and he were very close to each other. They worked together as plumbers. And, my dad always talked about him. And I think about my grandfather holding me up, saving me, and thinking that, that, he, that he prepared that all his life. He prepared for that moment to give himself, to give his own life for me, for a child. I think that's a perfect example of soul. It's a sense of, of commonality of life with other people. You don't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be your grandson. But a commonality, a strong feeling of connection to people, to me, that's one of the great gifts of soul. And almost everything that one says about soul is about that kind of deep, mysterious connection that you, you can hardly describe because it goes so deep. The soul is so deep that it, it is, it's deeper than our emotions. I don't think our emotional life is enough to describe what the soul is. It's deeper than emotion. It has to do with our very sense of meaning of being on the planet, of being a person, what it means to be a person. That's not just emotional. It's very hard to describe. It's like your absolute foundation of who you are. And that's what the soul is. And in a funny way, this is the way it's been taught for centuries. The soul is me, it's, a, it's I in a way, that's my soul. And that's what I experience. But in another way, it's even beyond me. The soul is more than who I am. So that even my identity, my sense of I, of myself, it, it takes its power from my soul, which is not just I, but somehow other. I have some other thing in me. Walt Whitman said this, he said, I am two, I am myself, and my soul. Wonderful words of Whitman, I think. He was a great soulful poet. We have had so many great soulful people and poets and singers and writers and all these people in our, in our uh, national community of, you know, we have to understand of all races and nationalities that in that realm of expression of soul you, you cross those boundaries. I mean, you, it, you do two things, really. I think you do two things at once that seem opposite. You have your own identity and your own culture and your own background and your own ethnicity and your own race. And then you have a bigger sense of self. You have a sense of identity with something bigger and ultimately with humanity itself. And we do those two things together. That's why I think in terms of race, it's so important to speak for your background, for, for the great 
people who have contributed so much to speak for them, which is why I feel feel it's important for me to start with uh, those that soul word of Martin Luther King. We have to speak of the culture of the background and our personal experience, but also of humanity itself. Because in a way, and this is also Walt, Walt Whitman, he said, we are, we are humanity. You know, we are, we are everything. It's all in us. Everything is in us. And that's part of soul. So Lauren was saying that I write about soul as being the soul of society. That's also my soul. So that when I uh, go outside and do what my wife is doing these days, painting trees, she is seeing the soul of the world there painting those trees. But she is also discovering herself. Because in a weird, strange, mysterious, mystical way, when you talk about soul, uh, ordinary reason in science and, and materialistic ways of looking at the world uh, go by the wayside. And you have to start thinking mysteriously and mystically. You become a mystic, really, in a way. And you look at that tree, and you look at those animals, and you have to say, in some real way, that's me. And my, my identity and my care for them has to be like caring for myself and those closest to me. I think it's the same when it comes to race, that we have, you know, we have accented the differences among us so much. And that's important. We, are, we, we really have our identity. That's important. But it's also to know at the very same time that when you look at another human being, you're seeing yourself. You are seeing yourself in a mystical way. We are not as separate as, as it seems that we are. It seems like we're all individuals, and we are, that's true. But in another way, we are all the human being. And that's a way of looking soulfully at things. I think that's the way the poets have taught us to see. I'm going to tell you another thing that just, just because it's important to me, starting with Martin Luther King, whenever I write a book, and I've written a bunch of them now, whenever I sit down to write a book, the first thing I do before I write a word, I go to the books of Jamaica Kincaid, and I read, I read her for two reasons. I read her because of her beautiful style. And uh, I, I just feel that her, her style is part of her, her, her race, of her, of her family, of her, of her people. And it's not, me, it's not me and it's not mine. And yet I read her and I realize she is me. She is doing what I want to do. She is my model and she is my ideal. And she writes about her mother a lot. Jamaica Kincaid writes about her mother in very interesting original ways. That's soul too, family. And that's why I start talking to you about my grandfather. Our families, thinking about our families, that's soul. The other person I read is Ralph Ellison, who is probably has one of the most beautiful English styles I know. I read him just to get myself going because I know that if I could write in his style, I'd be very happy at the end. And he writes more about race and he keeps that in mind, my mind as I write. Because I know as a writer, as a white writer, that I am writing for the people of the world. I, I had to learn that. I used to write for myself when I was young. And then I started getting letters from people all over the world. And I thought to myself, I have to stop writing for myself now. I have to have a different identity. I have to become a, a bigger person. I have to identify with a lot more people. And that was a great lesson for me. And now when I write, I write. Uh, I don't write as this uh, lone, lone white guy who has his own life to worry about. 
I write now understanding that I am the world and that my soul, the soul that I share is, the, is shared with many, many different people around me. And that enriches me. And I think I can write better because of it. So only one more thing is left for me to say about soul in a very concrete way. I can't define it. I can only talk about it in this manner. The language of soul is poetry and song and visual art and music. So the other thing that I can say is that we find soul in our food. When I first wrote Care of the Soul, I traveled the United States several times, made several trips to, I don't even remember how many cities. I thought I'd be talking about Plato and Aristotle and the soul. And instead I talked about food, it just came out. And I discovered, I, I learned, I didn't even know this. I learned that food is really the place where we find our soul. So when we are cooking, that is a soulful thing. I'm now a psychotherapist and I, when I treat, uh, treat people who are really having trouble, especially with depression, I talk to them about food and I encourage them to cook. And they say, what can I read to really become you know, a more soulful person? I say, read a cookbook or go online and take some lessons in cooking because it's in the kitchen that the soul is made. In food, the food we eat together too, gathering people together around food, it makes a huge difference to have food or not to have food. If you just sit around and talk and you have no food, your ideas aren't going to be very rich. You need to be eating somehow, you need something in your mouth. You need to be enjoying the flavors of food before you can really think well. And before you can be with people in a way where it's not just intellectual and not just, you know, your agenda, but is, but but's relaxed and your soul comes to the foreground. So there are all these ways to go at soul. They're not easy to talk about and they're unexpected, but I hope that uh, for our conversation today, they might uh, have some relevance rather than to have a lot of abstract ideas of what the soul is. Thank you so much, Thomas. We'll have a chance to um, talk in a minute, but I wanted to turn it over uh, to Reggie Wilbur. Hey. Thank you, Lauren, <clears throat> and thank you, uh, Thomas. Um, I'm going to abbreviate my comments a little, but I hope to pack a lot of punch. But I'm going to start by uh, sharing my screen, if I may. I've created a few slides, um, and I'm going to try and go through them briskly. I really want to approach the project thinking about soul as an artistry of living, um, particularly from a cultural standpoint. Um, without making any claims that the soul that I'm referring to is uniform across all Black folk. Um, but I do believe there is a cultural sensibility to how we talk about soul as lived artistically by and through Black folk. Um, so I'm interested today in talking about African-American arts and letters, particularly curating um, care for the soul. Um, when I think of soul, if I could come from Genesis 2 and 7, you know, when God breathed air into the nostrils of humankind, um, humankind became a living soul. And I really want to place emphasis on that living soul as I think about it. It's a very sacred space. Um, it is the seat of our emotions, but more than our emotions, it's not this detail. I think some people tend to think about the soul as this detached bodily or spiritual entity. I think of soul as dynamically connected to how we feel the heart and how we think the mind so that it is really this triune bodily governance structure, if you will. Um, but the soul is the core of our being. It is the animus of who we are. It responds, it can be grieved, it can be ebullient, it can be joyful and celebratory, it can be angry. Right? It can be all of these emotions, but it's packed with the punch. And I think it's possible for some people to have a soul and not knowing it. And when I think about that, 
this soulless wonder. I think about having that dynamic, but being so divorced from it, you hardly ever feel it. You hardly ever think it. Ultimately, you don't know it. And so for those of us who live life large, you know, I think about uh, W.E.B. Du Bois's landmark 1903 book, The Souls of Black Folk, right? I think of, when I think of soul, I think of Aretha Franklin and her third album with Atlantic, Lady Soul, right? Um, and when we think about what Aretha does with her voice and with her vocal instrument and what she does with the Muscle Shoals sound group behind her, the gospel that she brings, the blues tradition that she brings, her vocals must be heard and felt. I think of James Brown, I've got soul and I'm super bad, right? And so even this linguistic flair that matches the frenzy of funk, soul is funk, right? It's funky, it's Anita Baker, when she feels it, she's got to move and sway from left to right. Um, soul is an activity. For those of us who live it, how do we care for it? How do we curate care for the soul? And I want to make the case as an African-American literature scholar um, that the arts must never be forsaken as a valuable component for curating the care for the soul. I think it's too easy for individuals to just think of the arts as, oh, it's just entertainment, oh, the theater, um, and it is that, and there's a space for that. But I think as we think about this moment that we're in, we, this post-George Floyd moment, the COVID-19 moment, I think life has shown us so much in these past 12 to 14 months, how sacred the living of life is and how being bound up in our homes, remote from everyone else and from others, inhibited from traveling. How do we care for the soul a soul that should be dynamic, active, frenzied. And so I wish to talk about that through um, Black arts. And I am using the phrase Black arts, not in the sense of the Black arts movement, um, but arts as defined and understood and experienced by Black folk. And so for me, when I think about the Black arts and soulful living, it's an advocacy. I want to advocate for the arts as a beautiful science of restorative care for the mind, body, and soul. I use the phrase beautiful science. I think every skill under the sun re requires the poetry and the synthesis of the poetry with the scientific technique. And the seamless blending of the two gives us a beautiful science. There is a beautiful science for riding a bike. It's part elegant, but it's part balance. And somehow we blend those two elements to be able to ride a bike. And so similarly, the arts as a beautiful science of restorative care for the mind, body, and soul, it allows us to tap into the beauty, but also to understand it and direct it according to the science of various knowledges. And so in this mode of black arts, I'd say that the arts are more than mere entertainment or sheer brilliance, right? This thing to behold. Um, they hold the capacity for transporting our physical bodies beyond present time and space to an imagining of the worlds we occupy. When we sit in the theater, we are taking in and we're seeing, but it requires an active engagement. And although it may be a respite from the cares of the world, we're still forced to engage with the world through the sensory of our imaginative faculties. And so for the Black arts here in this fourth bullet, they hold this capacity when we will ourselves to cognitive activities of thinking deliberately through words, through figures, through images, through sound bites, visual stills, and kinetic defiances of time and space. So this is not the arts to hearken to the arts, is not to just sit back and relax and chill. It's not to sit in the theater seat and applaud, right? The arts is meant to be lived. It must be engaged and engaged so much so that we're still thinking even as we're being uh, entertained, if you will. For me, experiencing a life lived in the arts through cultural prisms of centered black difference is key, right? The art of Shakespeare is not necessarily the art of a Susan Laurie Parks, right? 
And so we want to cherish this art, the soul of Black living, through the full sensorial experience where we see, smell, hear, taste, and feel life via the intelligences of our imagining, right? And again, this is getting us away from just receiving stuff, right? We are to be engaged with the arts we pay our money for. In the quietude of these activities, I believe, exists myriad opportunities for rediscovering the worlds we inhabit. That is, we think we know the world until we are confronted with an artistic piece. And that piece, the intellectual artistic brilliance of some artist, some artistic genius, invites us to rediscover the world we think we know on any given day. And we re rediscover this world by querying them from heightened spaces of intellectual enlightenment. Why this color on this canvas? Why these shadings? Why is the perspective to the left and not in the center, right? Why this Shakespearean line in an August Wilson play? Right? Why does Aretha Franklin play in a scene from one of Wilson's plays that has nothing to do with Aretha Franklin? What is being communicated and where does our mind take us Right, when we think about the role of Aretha Franklin playing on a jukebox and a couple dancing and two trains running? Right? This is the type of imaginative engagement that I'm arguing for. This is more than the Sudoku puzzles or the crossword puzzles or the jumbo puzzles or the mindless TV where we just keep our minds just rolling around rote letters and phenomena because we're experiencing art. Everything in sight, sound, hearing, taste, and feeling is on the market to be re-understood relative to the worlds we occupy. This is an active engagement. This is the soul of artistry that I'm advocating for. Such activities, I believe, constitute a restorative care for the soul by doing life as opposed to life doing us, right? It's making the best of a few idle minutes while experiencing life that makes us think and feel it. Experiencing life in the sounds and thoughts of Blackness while sometimes confronting us with the unseemly in life, the bitter, the tragic, the stuff that makes us want to cry, it simultaneously can serve as a kind of catharsis, positioning us to contemplate the travails of difference as a kind of investigator of the human condition for ourselves, for the characters we encounter, for the personas in a poem, or the phenomena we encounter in the visual arts, or the fine, you know, the fine and performing arts, right? It's more than just the text or the still or the piece of pottery. It's the sensibilities encoded in form in the aesthetics. Each of these dynamics are making a vital statement about the life we live, the lives we share, the cultures we embrace. And so if I can proceed to my final uh, slide, I want to talk about three examples of curating the soul via Black arts. I think certainly in times like these, all of us need some kind of artistic valuable piece that we can instantly hearken to in times of travail, in times of anger, where sometimes we just want to celebrate being happy. But do you know what those pieces are? Can your fingers readily find it on your iPod, on your bookshelf? on your walls, right? And so for me, and I have multitudes of them, but for me, sometimes it can be reading African-American poetry as an artist, not reading it just to, for the sake of reading, but I'm talking about really interrogating the words and allowing your mind to ponder why this theme, why this form, why these words, why this image? How do these blended uh, components force me to be actively engaged with the world that I think that I know, right? Um, I'm presently, in, in many ways, this is like a, a follow-up to the, the poetry uh, program that we did the last three months, but like I am presently like so in love with Jericho Brown's The Tradition and poems that I've read, I'm rereading now and gaining a deeper appreciation in the solitude of my life. Uh, yesterday, I downloaded, I purchased 
Janet Jackson's Control album, right? Um, and instantly remind, in addition to the music, in addition to the funk, that was that was like a very uh, groundbreaking album for Janet Jackson. Like her previous albums before that were really like kind of duds. Um, but this one with Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis behind the scenes, um, it was like a breakout album for her. And it has these feminist sensibilities of a black woman taking control, merged with the funk. And while listening to it last night in my car, I got wound up. I remember all of the videos, the videos from What Have You Done For Me Lately, for Nasty, for Control, um, When I Think Of You, right? Um, and there's a certain reliving of the past that comes back. And things that I would have never thought about, I think when that album came out in 86, I don't think I even knew what the word feminism was. But now that I do and I teach it, to listen to that album and now experiencing it as funky feminist emancipation, right? Makes that album that I thought that I knew from more than two decades ago, relevantly new in startling brisk ways. Sometimes when I'm down and I mean like really down, I know to go to Sylvester's Living Proof album. And what I love about, when I play Sylvester's Living Proof, I know that I'm really down and I need to pick me up. And it starts with the last three tracks. Sylvester, as many of you know, is this gay black icon from Oakland um, who really became famous during the disco era backed by um, the two women who were originally known as the Two Tons of Fun, but Martha Walsh and uh, Azora. Um, I can't remember Azora's last name right now, but their version of You Are My Friend, if you don't know that song, oh my God, what it will do for you in the moment of despair. And then it's quickly followed by this like 12 minute romp, disco romp, Baptist church infused dancing heat. And then it ends with this torrid version of You Make Me Feel Mighty Real, which is one of Sylvester's biggest hits. But all three of these are examples right, Sylvester, Janet Jackson, and Jericho Brown are examples of the way that we can actively live life through the arts. And I would champion that each of us thinks about how we can restore an appreciation for the arts, even as we work with the arts as a restorative practice for curating the care of our souls. And when we can do that, if we look at the world now and we look at this position where we are continually, institutions of higher education are continually asked to make the return on an investment, which for me is so obvious. I don't think that that should be defended, but we're living in an age where the arts are being defended, right? Where even words and alternative facts can mean whatever anyone wants to. And as we know, with black culture in particular, when you strip a people of their language and their culture, that is the making of a slave. Right, And I fear that where we are now, if we don't really cherish the arts, not only for the individual curating and care for our souls, but for the body politic and the world at large, we may be just as enslaved as my ancestors were prior to the Emancipation Proclamation. And so I'll end there and, um, and toss it back to you, Lauren. Thank you so much. There's so much in what you all, we both shared. Um, I'm trying to decide between the first question I prepared and skipping to another, but I think I will stick with my first question for now as a grounding for us. Um, and uh, I'm moved by what you, sh you shared, um, Reggie. Um, but I'm gonna turn this next question to you, Thomas. Um, again, as sort of a, a, a way to sort of get us in the same realm um, in, in this conversation. You talked about wanting to, to um, in, have this conversation about soul, this interaction about soul in a particular way. And so I want to turn this back to you to land us there. Um, so you talk about soul as a quality or a dimension of experience, and you, you spoke to that beautifully, Reggie, um, just in an embodied way. You both did, right? With family and music. Um, so you talk about soul as a quality or dimension of experience. 
and care is husbandry, devotion, adorning the body, healing, um, worshiping the gods. And you describe therapy um, in the frame, sort of using ideas of Socrates, like the care you would give a horse on a farm. You feed it, you brush it, um, you clean its, you clean its stall. Can you say more about um, your approach to care of the soul? Um, can you say more about about these things that that you've written? I'll try. Um, I, uh, I I see care of the soul primarily as care. Care is an important word. It's a word worth reflecting on because it flip, comes off our lips so easily, and it may not seem to be very important. But if you distinguish it from other things. Care is not analysis. It is not cure. It's not curing or fixing. It's not making things better. Care is something different. When you give water to a horse, I mean, you're really not improving the horse. You're, you're, you're making sure that it's, it's, you know, it sustains itself and that it's healthy. And I think that's really what care of the soul is then. It's something you don't, you don't care for lots of things. You do care for the soul. That's what's appropriate to the soul, care rather than some other operation. A lot of people think that care of the soul or therapy, by the way, the word therapy, you know, psychotherapy, the word psychotherapy for the Greeks meant care of the soul. That's what the words mean, care of the soul. So um, I think that when a lot of people think of therapy as uh, as fixing what has gone wrong or uh, making better self-improvement, that kind of thing. And what I try to do as I'm a psychotherapist, what I try to do is one who cares for the soul of people who are maybe suffering the one thing or another is to care for them, offer care for that soul of theirs, to bring it to their attention that you, you have a soul, you are, you are worth a great deal your worth comes from the fact that you are a human being so connected with the rest of the world. You are everything. You summarize everything in yourself. So we want to care for that soul. And uh, one way I do it is uh, it's related to, uh, to the arts, but maybe tangentially is that I, I work with people's dreams, their night dreams, which is in a way the art of the soul. You know, it's pieces of narrative. It's a form that we don't usually see too much in our conscious art. It's there, of course, the dream is in art, but, but uh, for the individual, it's so interesting to say that, you know, a good part of your life is spent in another place, in, in dramas and in scenes and in encountering characters that are very important to you, but you may not know them very well. So that's, <clears throat> that's one way that I care for the soul. <clears throat> I, uh, I help people, I'm with people as they tell me their night dreams and we reflect on them. And to me, as someone who's lived in the arts all my life, I often see connections between the arts and the dream. So to me, uh, this dream work and care that it's how it relates, how that dream relates to daily life is a sort of artwork. You know, it's like going from the image of the night dream to the lived experience. And I loved what Reggie said about this, about how the, and it's very subtle in a way, that once you see a piece of art, you are not the same. And when you go into your life, you are not looking the same. You won't have the same experience because of, of a, a work of art that you have really encountered. And that's the same with dream. Once you see the dream, it's very similar. And once you explore it with somebody who can help you explore it, you, you won't be the same. Because you discover that your life is really an art, that we are in a narrative all the time that we are meeting characters, not just people. We are, we are, <laughs> I often say, for example, that if you write your autobiography, it will be a novel. 
it's uh, it's not a it's not a statement of fact it's your imagination of what your life is that's an art form and i think our lives are art forms so um that's how i care for the soul i see very much what uh, appreciate so much what reggie was saying that the arts are are there as a lived experience and that the particular art makes such a difference to you the particular thing the performer the the artist the the, the artwork is each one is so important to give you a way into your experience of life because you are an art you are an art form thank you um I, I, uh, I relate to that so much in the, uh, I recall when I first read uh, The Sanctified Church by Zora Neale Hurston, and she talked about black language and it's um, sort of maximalism, you know, a sitting chair, and that it was embodied. And I thought, oh, there's a way in which, you know, the little, um, those little heart lockets that uh, one person gets and another person gets. And you know they, they're on different people. I thought, oh, I didn't know that I was part of something that needed this other something that was contained in her language, that reconnected me to a part of who I was. Like the 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 way she embraced her work was a reconstitution of of herself and myself and blackness in the most beautiful way. So um, that that resonates with me so uh, deeply. Um, so let's see. There's so much here. I want to ask one other question, and then and then um, and then, depending on how long it takes, then turn to into the into the chat. Uh, so one of the things that you do, uh, Thomas, in your work, or that you describe in your work, is um, turning into places of discomfort, turning into symptoms and not, and not approaching them as, as problems to be fixed, but as invitations. Um, you call them sort of initiations into soul work, which I just find so lovely. Um, and um, you, you work with mythology and story as a way to sort of invite into new ways of imagining. Again, that word that you used, um, uh, Reggie, uh, a way to sort of open the soul, form the soul craft the soul. So I just wanted to, to experiment with something. Um, W.E.B. Du Bois's book, The Soul of Black, Souls of Black Folk is, is familiar, mm -hmm. as is this passage. Um, and I wanna approach it in a certain way. Where does it start? Da, 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 da. This is the page. Sorry, I can't. It's going to take me one more second. Okay. So I'm going to read this passage and then I'm going to ask you a question. Um, I'll probably start with you, Reggie, um, in the spirit of your work, uh, Thomas. So he says, the Negro is a sort of seventh son, born with a veil and gifted with second sight in this American world with true self-consciousness, but only lets him see himself through the revelation of the other world. It is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, the sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, Two warring ideals in one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. The history of the American Negro is the history of this strife. This longing to attain self-conscious manhood, I would say personhood, to merge his double self into a better and truer self. In this merging, he wishes neither of the older selves to be lost. He would not Africanize America, for America has too much to teach the world and Africa. He would not bleach his Negro soul in a flood of white Americanism, 
for he knows that Negro blood has a message for the world. He simply wants to make it possible for a person to be a, both a Negro and, a, and an American without being cursed upon and spit upon by his fellows, without having the doors of opportunity closed roughly in his face. Um, so uh, this then is the end of his striving to be a co-worker in the kingdom of culture, to escape both death and isolation, to husband and use his best powers and his latent genius. These powers of body and mind have in the past been strangely wasted, dispersed, or forgotten. So um, the reason I sort of chose that passage um, is that it speaks to some extent to our cultural moment, right? We are Black in America, those of us who are Black. Um, and, and I thought, you know, typically I've heard that text um, and conversation about the two-ness of Black's experience, the doubleness of Black experience as a, as a challenge. And I sort of wondered what it might look like um, to sort of probe into that question in the spirit of your work. That is such a deep experience of blackness. What, what has that um, provided for, for, for black people? What has that opened for black people? What does that have opened for black society? So does this make sense what I'm talking about, Thomas and Reginald? Mm -hmm. So I, I would love to start with um, you, uh, Reg Reggie. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, just invite your your thoughts about about what it might what opens if we take an alternate kind of look at mm -hmm. tunis as mm -hmm. a as a mode of black experience yeah so it's vexed mm -hmm. um because as you will know, and many who, who are familiar with that text and particularly in that chapter, right the war is the Negro of that time trying to understand how to negotiate life as both Black and an American, right? And of course, we know that we are American, but we live in a world that is continually negating our existence, right? And so to see, to be on, on to see life from the veil of Blackness outward into whiteness, it comes with a heightened knowledge of how we know and perceive white people to understand us, particularly in moments in conflict. The moment a blue light goes off behind me, I have to go and I have to, psychically, I have to operate in a different way. I have to think about how to care for my black body, how to answer the right questions. I've got to pull out my Scrabble words to make sure that I sound familiar and knowable all the while knowing that won't necessarily save me in and of itself, right? So it's the psychic emotional negotiations, right? Um, and then connected to that, like, <laughs> I know who I am, right? So there's a sense of self agency, but if I'm too agential, then I risk, run the risk of being perceived as uppity, right? As non-compliant. Right. So what happens to open up that that aperture, if you will, is to entertain a vexed consciousness. <laughs> and, and he uses the phrase, right, the dogged will to stay alive. Right. But to see to have to see life from that perspective and it's tonal, it's when we're in the office and people label us as not a teamwork because we're too confrontational because we name stuff that needs to be named. And whereas maybe other people will take it, then we're seen as bad people or the bad individual or the angry black woman, right? Or the Malcolm X, um, when really we're just speaking truth. Why can't truth be spoken? And what is it about the black voice when it elevates, when it speaks with all of the energy that I'm talking about, that I've been talking about earlier? Um, we love it when it entertains us, but when it critiques white America, then we become problematic. We must be eradicated, dismissed, drowned out. Um, or, you know, Thomas talked about the invisible man, right? Keep the nigger running, right? Is the recurrent phrase an invisible man, right? Which is its own psychosis, right? So it's like how to understand 
the psychosis of America and holding on to the integrity of one's being, even as one has to strategically navigate it in order to stay alive among the white people. And I think that's just, that's just Black Living 101. That doesn't even get to the complexities, the deeper complexities. That's just like first week syllabus for Black Living 101. Does, does that entertain what some of what you were asking? It does. I, um, it does. And I, and I uh, you know, it's complex. It's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's counterintuitive. I think mm -hmm. some of the, mm -hmm. um, the invitation of your work, Thomas, mm -hmm. the invitation to take what, what is, uh, you know, the experience of Tunis is, is, is that, that sort of navig is, is so often painful. Mm -hmm. And, and the part of the invitation of your work is to sort of move into it and see and see what it is, see what it could become, not as a problem to be solved, but as a as an opportunity to grow soul. And I, you know, that's it's always, you know, I noticed in your work the tension, right? The difficulty of not minimizing pain and also opening experience. And so I, I wonder what you what what where also you would go with this. What I try to say is that uh, uh, one of our one of the uh, uh, principles I work on is go with the symptom, not against it. Go into the symptom, go with it, uh, no matter what that symptom is. It's counterintuitive because when you do have suffering and pain, the natural tendency is to want to go to the opposite direction and try to find some alternative way of being and maybe an escape from the, the painful feeling and the experience. What happens though, when you go with the symptom, which takes some imagination and some endurance and patience, is that you, um, you no longer are, are trying to be somebody that you are not. Uh, and the uh, if you can stay with that and learn from it, discover, I shouldn't say learn so much, it's not like a learning lesson, it's more that you are transformed in the process. You begin to see things somewhat differently and you get different language for what before was painful. Now it, it's a different form of, of, uh, of language. Let me get, can I give you an example that's not related to our conversation, but I think it might help. But one issue that people bring to me quite often is uh, jealousy. So they feel very jealous and they're, they're worried about it in their relationship and so on. And, and they, they would love to get rid of it. In fact, they come to me saying, can you help me get rid of my jealousy? You see, that is not going with the symptom. That is trying to get rid of it. How can I, how can I be a different person? How can I get rid of this painful thing? I need to get rid of it. Well, in a certain way, yes. Jealousy is not only painful, it's dangerous. And, uh, and yes, there's a way in which maybe we would all like you to be free of that jealousy. But do you do it by going in the opposite direction or do you do it by embracing the jealousy and exploring those, those feelings that you have? This is not masochistic saying, I just, okay, or giving up and saying, oh, I guess you're telling me I should just be a jealous person. No, take it in, reflect on it, become, think about the importance of reflection, of taking something in and reflecting on it rather than trying to immediately get rid of it. And when you do that, the jealousy ultimately then transforms where it no longer is that extreme uh, painful feeling of jealousy. Now what it is, is the discovery that if I want to be in a relationship with someone, I'm going to have to be vulnerable to them and let them live their own life to some extent. I had to give up my thoughts, my simplistic thinking before of what a relationship is. Now, I don't know if I'm in a position to apply that to our conversation because it's, you know, it's difficult for me to, to talk that way. But I, I would think that this sense that I am two people. If that is the symptom, if that's the suffering, if that's the problem, I feel divided or I feel like I'm two people. 
uh, and this doesn't feel good, I would say the thing, to, what we have to do is reflect on is how can I be two people? What is that like? What's it about? Uh, what is my history of this feeling of being uh, two different people? And eventually come to a place where you can say, well, in some ways I am two people. And how can I, how can I do that in a way that is creative, productive, and not full of suffering? I really, you know, I can't answer that question. I really can't. But I think that's the approach. That's what I would, that's what the way I would handle it. Thank you, Reginald. And um, I will note that uh, uh, Reverend Bob Thompson um, had his uh, hand up. So I will turn it over to you, Reggie, and mm -hmm. then to Bob. And then there's a question in the, um, in the, uh, chat that I'll take. Yeah. And I would even want to compliment, complicate this discussion even further. Of course, Du Bois is talking about double consciousness, but then depending on the different identity contingencies one holds, that consciousness is fragmented even more. So Black women, right, or to be a Black lesbian, or to be Black trans, right, of a lower socioeconomic who might be disabled. When we live in a world that is structured around certain privileges, each new identity contingency amplifies the consciousness, the numerical consciousness that a marginalized individual holds. And we see that from the moment, we see it again in the contemporary moment, the moment President Biden announced who his running mate was and what that meant for little girls, not only in the US, but across the world. That is a clear reminder of how this consciousness operates because we've never witnessed that before, the possibility. And it will happen again once we have our first woman president, right? And so these, this consciousness gets amplified relative to the marginalized identities you hold. And that tells me that there's a great responsibility on all of us, given the privileges that we have according to the identities we hold. So for me, it would be male, right? My male privilege, right? And how do I understand bias without the lens of patriarchy that I inherited? I, I, uh, I asked this question, um, not knowing an answer to it, mm -hmm. but seeing that seeing the, the, sh the shape of your work, Thomas, and um, sort of, and a sort of an archetypal experience, an archetypal component of black experience and seeing what happens when they meet up. And it, I feel like it invites, um, it, it sort of raises to awareness, a dynamic of uh, sort of black soulhood <laughs> or whatever, um, which is the, the, the difficulty of extracting um, the soul of a nation, the soul of society, from our from our for our, from our own experience, and sort of how to how to be engaging with the, the kinds of processes you invite in the context of Black experience. Um, so I didn't I didn't it wasn't a, it wasn't a question with a with an idea of an answer. It was a really I don't know. So so thank you both and um, uh, Reverend Thompson. Thank you. Um, you know when Aretha Franklin. Uh, was named the queen of soul, it was very clear what soul was in that sense. It was something that was going to get you to feel something and it was going to uh, be joy filled in, in a way that maybe other music certainly was not. And she was called the queen of soul because she communicated such passion. So soul connects to passion. But I also think that soul, and this is, this is, my, this is my comment, maybe it's a question. Uh, soul seems to be strengthened through adversity. So, uh, so that through the centuries, uh, that song I sang at the beginning, uh, Go Down Moses, captured the soulful passion of the Exodus, the first Exodus, the, the Jews being, being brought out of bondage. And, it, it, and, and the, 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 the enslaved Africans who are my ancestors, Reggie's ancestors, the ancestors of all of us really, for what they did made all life appear possible in New England. I mean, okay. so. 
what happens is that um, when I'm able to fight my way through my own difficulty, and when the pain, when I put the pain on notice and say, you are not going to be the last of me, then it requires that I, that I move out of that Tunis. I can't be there and still be dual. It forces me to come together, and sometimes that's very painful, which is why I sing spirituals, because it captures the pain of that past, and it gives an outlet for my current day pain just because the songs are so effective. So I guess the question I'm asking is, uh, what, how would you speculate on the connection of soul awareness to uh, personal struggle or difficulty? Well, I think that that's certainly there um, and certainly a vital and ecstatic part of Black soulhood. Um, as I was thinking, as I was reflecting on uh, how you were defining it or, I, or resonating with it, um, I was also thinking too, but I also want a soul that is also connected to gaiety, the gaiety of life, right? So in as much as I recognize that there is some of our most memorable soulful moments are derivative of pain, but there's a way in which that type of narrative limits or can limit, potentially limits, right? The full embodied experience of black joy. And I think that there can be black joy devoid of pain where we see ourselves just dancing and leaping and shouting and shrieking and loving one. I mean, I'm thinking of, again, Anita Baker's uh, sweet love, right? That is a happy love, right? And when she gets to rocking, right, the music is doing something. Now there is the argument that the blues undertones is rooted in pain, but it's a joyful song, That's right? right. Um, so I don't know, I think I really appreciate that aspect. Um, you can't have what, it make, what, what makes Aretha so great without the pain of the blues and the gospel the gospel church, right? In the black church, you really can't have that even when she's singing the happy songs, right? So, I mean, I think that that is always there and present, but at, at the same time, I think I want a space in the arts that allows for such a thing as black joy and celebration. The Jubilee songs, if you will. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, mm -hmm. Reggie. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And I'll just, one, one more comment, then I, then I promise I'll be- I'll I'm gonna say a I'll, tiny thing and then I'll pop you back. Okay. What's lovely about what you say is that that speaks to a kind of tunis when when Cornel West talks mm. about tragic comic hope, mm. you know, that 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 there maybe there's something in black experience that primes us to embrace paradox and uh, you know, uh -huh. multiplicity that lives in paradox. Yes, yes. I don't have to ask you a question now. You, you, you. No, no, please. I, I no, didn't. No, mean no, 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 no. You, 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 you did fine with that one. I don't have to say anything else. <laughs> All right. Uh, Thomas, did you have something to add? There's a lot of things I could add. Uh, two th I'll just to say two things. One is that uh, in all my work uh, on soul, I've discovered that one of the descriptions of soul that stands uh, throughout history is that it is multiple. It is multiple. And the images for soul primarily have been the planets in the sky. That's the traditional image. So that means that there are as many qualities of soul, you know, as you can see the stars in the sky, really. And uh, that, 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 so therefore, yes, it would be a mistake to say that you only want sad expressions of soul. That's not, that's not the way to do it. And it's not just sad and gay either. It is sad and uh, 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 intimate, uh, uh, happy and, um, and childlike, there are just infinite numbers of qualities, emotional qualities. So the soul is multiple. And one of the traditions of care of the soul is uh, avoid the monarchy of one emotion or one quality. Understand the soul is multiple, that you've got to do a lot of different things. Don't just make it one, one particular kind of thing. On the other hand, there's another thing about the song uh, uh, that song, Go Down Moses, is that uh, there's also a tradition in care of the soul uh, to, uh, if you're going through a certain mood or pain or suffering or going through any experience at all, that you can uh, bring some uh, uh, help to it, you can, you can help it 
by uh, bringing in an art that is that doesn't go against that emotion, that is in tune with it. So if you're feeling sad, play some sad music. If you're feeling happy, make sure you have happy music. Go be congruent with the art and the uh, experience, a human experience that is going on. Again, the natural tendency might be to go into the opposite direction. So if you say, okay, I'm not feeling so good today, I'm going to really play some cheerful music. Well, maybe it wouldn't be a bad idea to play some melancholic music in order to, uh, in order to deepen your experience of what you're going through. And that way come through the experience to happiness rather than go around it to try to look for happiness. Thank you uh, so much. So I, uh, there was a question. Let's see, uh, there's so many questions here. There was one that, um, Uh, I found it, Lauren. Okay, to ask, yep, if go I ahead. Do, it's from Sue Kim. Uh, sure, if, if tell me what going, it is. If you were going with the symptom, how would that look if the symptom is systemic racism or sexism or homophobia in the soul of our nation or even in an individual person? Shall I respond to that? <laughs> okay. Um, if if yes, that those are those are tricky, difficult things for sure. But um, it's one thing to spend your time uh, fighting homophobia and racism, which is something we we have to do. Obviously, we do. Um, but it might add to the experience. We might get. We might be even more effective ultimately to to reflect more deeply on our experience without the thought of of, of uh, how can I overcome this. It might be important to be able to take that experience on and reflect more, have more conversation, more time to reflect, more writing that reflects on the experience to get to a deeper place. I mean, what's going on here? If, do you want to be in a position where you have a, the enemy and you fight the enemy forever and ever and probably not get anywhere? I don't think so. I think that you find, let's go back to uh, the quote from Martin Luther King, the soul power, the soul force would come from the, what, what comes from deeper reflection, which is not divided like that from the word go. So, uh, this is not an either or. Yes, you can you can move uh, socially against the oppression. Absolutely, we we you know and we give our lives for that. We do what we can for that. But what I'm saying is that to have soul power, to follow Martin Luther King's direction, would be to pay more attention to our symptom and to see what is really going on here. What is it? What is that racism? What is that homophobia? What is it? Can I look at it without judging it? Can I look at it without fighting it just for a few moments? Can I say time out? I'm going to go meditate on this for a while and I'm not going to be in my heroic place where I have to do something about it. I'm going to be in my less heroic, my non-heroic place, my anti-heroic place where I can reflect on it more deeply and maybe reach it, get to a point where I finally have a better sense of what's happening here and then be more effective in dealing with it. I'd like to answer that question, if I may, by, um, it, it, it struck me while Thomas was talking. Um, I, I wonder if sometimes, you know, this is still responding to Sue's question. I wonder sometimes in as much as the inclination may be that of uh, overcoming a particular ism. I wonder if sometimes the matter is living with it and not living with it in a sense of resignation or consignment, but living with it until you can make things better or things become better, right? And in that sense, 
I, I keep coming back. You started us down this path, this rabbit hole, Lauren, um, when you mentioned Du Bois as souls of Black folk. But, you know, there's that passage in chapter one where he talks about when his white schoolmates tried to get the best of him and, and mistreat him and he wanted to beat them by their stringy heads. Rather than resigning himself to violence, he said he decided he'd live above them in the blue sky, right? Which is like a mental activity of, yes, I'm disadvantaged down here, but there are way, I know that I'm smarter than you. And so I'll live above you in my head in the blue sky of matter. And so it strikes me that sometimes to get back to my point around the curating, the care of the soul through the arts, the arts and the black arts in particular um, is, becomes a repository of strategic maneuvers on how to get over so that when that even defies when the soul looks back and wonders, right? So um, I would make the case, here's yet another example why the arts can be, and curating the soul through a care for the arts matters because there are so many black writers, all of the slave narrators of the 19th century before the Emancipation Proclamation, certainly it was doing a work for white readers. What did it do for blacks? Is the question, right? What did the 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 slave, um, I mean the Negro spirituals, what did they do for black folk in the 19th century, right? In the heat of the Reconstruction era, right? The black newspapers. And so I think sometimes the ism of a particular day is too overwhelming to get over in the meantime. What do you do? For those of us who was not down with less than 46, I don't even dignify his number, but those of us, the four years that less than 46 was in presidential office, right? How did we get over? What did we do? How did we negotiate those four years? We were powerless to get him out of office. How did we live? How did we get over? How does our soul look back and wonders how we made it over those four years, right? It could very well be that some of us put our head down, utilize the repositories at our disposal. And so I think that there's another way in which sometimes the, we can get through. We may not be able to get over. How do we get through and live? Um, thank you, Reggie. So I want to uh, pull this back. I want to pull this back just a little bit before we end our time together, which is soon, um, because we, we've we've t we've turned to talking about our country a little bit, and you know, the mention of George Floyd is in the just sort of talk about why we're even having this series of of tea talks in the first place, and so and and. The president, you know, decided decided to, to run um, explicitly because he was concerned about the soul of America. And then, mm -hmm. you know, we all know that the that the the stated purpose of the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference was to redeem the soul of America. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I do wonder whether. So I want I want to um, read something that comes from uh, a chapter in your in your book, Thomas about narcissism. Um, uh, so, and you're talking about the United States. You said that which is young in us pines and yearns. It feels separation keenly and painfully desires attachment. So the myth, I don't know if I'm starting too early. So the myth suggests, the myth of Narcissus, suggests that we are on our way toward healing narcissism when we feel an overwhelming to desire to be the person we newly imagine ourselves to be. And this will make sense to everyone else who hasn't just read this chapter very shortly. Nations, as well as individuals, can go through this initiation. America has a, America has a great longing to be the new world of opportunity and a moral beacon for the, beacon for the world. It longs to fulfill these narcissistic images of itself. At the same time, it's painful to realize the distance between the reality and that image. America's narcissism is strong. It is paraded before the world. If we were to put the nation on the couch, we might discover that narcissism is its most obvious symptom. And yet that narcissism holds the promise that this all important myth can find its way into life. In other words, America's narcissism is its Un unrefined 
pure, 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 pure spirit of genuine new vision. The trick is to find a way to that water of transformation where hard self-absorption turns into loving dialogue with the world. So um, what you do in parts of this book is look at uh, sort of uh, soul and society. And um, one of the things that, uh, one of the things that's sort of keeps popping up in this, in this uh, conversation is how much, how close um, people in certain identities are tethered to the state of the soul of the society. And that is probably no accident that Black people have been so involved in sort of unearthing and transforming this work. And you talk about soul force and um, the use of soul force uh, over against brute force to, 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 to transform. Um, well, anyway, so I just would love for you to speak to that, to, to um, care, for, care, of the, care of the soul in society and how individuals relate to that. First of all, let me say that, uh, just to clarify that, that image of America as narcissistic. Uh, my point is that the, that the story of Narcissus, a young man who's very narcissistic, who discovers himself at a pond in a pool and sees his reflection. When he sees who he is and loves him, he's transformed, he loses his narcissism and becomes a human being, becomes a real person. America, that's why I'm saying if we could uh, fulfill our, our narcissistic symptom, we might become people who actually can love the world and do something from, from that position. And uh, now that's, that's looking at society as having its own soul and its own psychology. And that is true of the society as a whole. And it is true to some extent of everyone who is American in this case. Uh, we participate in that American society. We don't, not in the sense that we are all narcissists or racists, obviously, just, you know, we are all different, but we, we do share in the, the fate of this country. It's our fate too. And I think that uh, if we're going to uh, want to change things, if we, what's our motivation for changing things of, of dealing with race, race, racism? I think it is ultimately for ourselves as well. It's not a narcissistic uh, care of ourselves, but rather we want to live in a society that is a good place to be. I, I, I assume we want that. We want to be in a place where we can be fulfilled and we're not just fighting battles all the time. So how do we do that? We have to see the psyche of the society and look at it more deeply. In a certain way, we have to be psychologists of the country. We have to be the therapists of the country. Uh, that's our job. I think that during this, the last four years, many of us were incubating. That's, that's the way I would see it. We were in an incubation period. We were like chickens ready to be hatched. You couldn't see us do anything, but we were hard at work. We were incubating a lot of things. My hope was that we would come out of that four years, the last four years, with a great deal of new ideas and new passion. And, and in a better place than we were at the beginning of it because we were incubating. So that's part of the soul of this country. We, uh, we, we you know, I don't know, my experience is, I've been around here a long time. I, uh, I, uh, I've been under presidents, more presidents that I didn't care for uh, than ones I liked. I've just had a few that I thought I could relax with. Um, so I've been incubating a lot over the over my lifetime, and uh, and going through passively going through a lot of things. That is being part of the psyche of the country, and it's not always good. It's not where you always want to be. Um, so you have to do the work. You know, you have to do your reflection, and you have to speak. I say this to therapists all the time that I teach, and to psychiatrists and medical people. You've got to get out there and speak. Don't sit back and be quiet. You've got to speak too. That's part of this. That's part of your therapeutic work. We have to be therapists to this country. We can't just be rebels. We have to be therapists. That means being wise and, and strategic 
and reflective of what we do, therapists to the psyche as well as uh, activists and so on. Uh, but that's that, that would be, of course, that's where I'm coming from. But I think I think our society needs care of the soul, which is therapy, uh, as much as the individuals do. May I toss one last question um, to you, Reggie? Mm -hmm. Thank sure. you so much, Thomas. Um, and that is sort of connected to that. Um, you know, to the extent that the church is is charged with 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 care of the soul, mm -hmm. um, you know, the black church, the 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 here here is a place where tunis exists uh, less, perhaps, in the black church than in mm -hmm. some other places. Which is that the the idea of uh, attention to what's happening in society and attention mm -hmm. to what's happening in our in in, in one's own body is, mm -hmm. um, you know. The idea that it's separate, <laughs> the idea that that the work to um, to um, uh, desegregate schools is mm -hmm. separate from from soul formation mm -hmm. doesn't exist in the same way in the black church, in my experience. Mm -hmm. um, and and can can you speak to the role of the black church and 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 how how um, those two things exist mm -hmm. together? in all the ways they do. Do you know what I'm talking about? I think I do. I mean, but even that is dynamic, right? Because there's so much going on. I mean, I think so much about, for me, so much about the Black church experience is a type of escapism, even as it is that therapy that Thomas was talking about. But then it's also extended kin, right? It's the pageantry of hats and shoes and matching bags and gloves. It's the pageantry of choir robes. It's the shout. It's the word itself. It's the right hand of fellowship. Um, it's Children's Day, right? And Children's Day poems and recitations, church anniversaries, traveling with the pastor. Um, it's the street ministries. Um, it's a training ground. You know, it's vacation Bible school with a Black cultural focus or subtext. Um, it's, you know, have a particular moment in time, right? It's fried fish and chicken dinners to help burn the mortgage. Um, you know, so it's that cooperative engagement. It's a community within a community within a community. Um, and all of those things combine as a type of therapy, if you will, still working with Thomas's idea. Um, it's an inner Black cultural therapy that's working out on religious terrain in multiple ways um, from Sunday to Sunday. And depending on the church, I mean, you could be in church every night of the week in certain Black churches, right? So it's this continual engagement that kind of insulates you from the troubles of this world because you're always engaged with skin folk and kin folk. It's really an inter I mean, you're, it's it's really a dynamic. It's an interesting dynamic that um, it's like the more I talk, there's just more things to be mined. I think that gives it gives a sense of just how dynamic that Black church experience. And then there's the political resonances, right? Whether it's local, state, or national. Thank you so much. I think am I am I Jerry Ann? Am I at the end of my time? Is it my time to say thank you to everyone? We have time for one more, and then you pass it on to Selena. <laughs> Taylor. Okay. Reverend Bob, do you have anything to add about, about um, the, the holding of the, the sort of the church within the community and the community embodied out in society? You know, so many of so many leaders um, emerge out of the black out of the black church that's less true now than it than it was 40 years ago but um but uh i i um uh, yeah i am off um there was incidentally someone else i saw another hand get raised but i couldn't find it because i was just trying to help you out there um i what i'm mostly aware of is uh that the deeper i go in my own mind or heart or in my imagination into the lives of the hearts of others, 
the more I feel an engagement with my spirit or my soul. And so this isn't really on the point, but it's just kind of what I'm thinking about this. So, so, so soul for me really has to do with attention, attention. So you pay attention and it engages the soul. I mean, and that's, and that's just true, even in walking down the street. If you just pay attention to the flowers, then you will feel amazed because you will see there's beauty here. Why did God give us beauty? Oh, maybe he wants us to feel better. Let me pay attention. And it engages the soul. You know it. You know it. It's, it's pre-verbal mm -hmm. and it's non-rational. Mm -hmm. uh, but, it, but, it, it, but it doesn't mean that it's not real. It's just pre-verbal and it's non-rational it's extra rational it's it's more than just the function of your of your of your rational processes it's it's that reflecting on the reality of your emotional journey your emotional or spiritual journey uh so so i really i really love singing spirituals and i mean i sing them a lot and uh and the reason is for one thing i i i, I see their very existence as being proof of victory, uh, as well as evidence of faith well lived. Because those Africans who were enslaved prayed for their children to be free. And if not their children, their grandchildren. And so when I'm singing these sorrow songs or these spirituals, which don't leave me feeling sorrow sorrowful, they just give me an opportunity to connect with that deep passion that deep sorrow, perhaps, or that deep sadness or anxiety. I have permission to go there, but that's not where I end up. Uh, when Tom was saying, that if you're feeling kind of sad, you play music that's sad. Well, if you do that and you begin moving away from it, then your mood will change. Well, when I sing the spirituals, I am trying so hard to go as deeply as I can and connect with that pain. I am trying so hard. If I can't do it, I don't want to sing it. And then when I finish, I feel freer. I feel, I feel connected to people. I, I look in their eyes and I can see we connected. Uh, and I think that this embodied uh, pain and joy, uh, it's something that's really part of the African American experience. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it is out of that connection of pain and joy, along with the, the, the miracle, the grace of music that blues developed and the spirituals and work songs. All of these musics were ways that our ancestors made sense out of no sense, mm -hmm. <laughs> found mm -hmm. the strength to go forward when, when there was no strength available. I'm gonna to try to talk, I'm gonna stop now because I can go on. Oh, it's lovely. <laughs> it's beautiful. What uh, you reminded me of the Reverend Dr. Howard Thurman, who I once heard in this old video say, uh, the more I go down into my own experience, the deeper down I go, the more I come up inside the experience of another person. And uh, so early on, there was lots of uh, conversation about all, us all being sort of one and one human race. And I, I, I do, you know, there's a way in which um, the, uh, color blindness can be erasure. And I love that idea of of uh, going down into an experience and coming up inside the experience of another person because it marries that the oneness of humanity with particularity of experience, which is so much a component of soul that you talk about, Thomas, particularity and rootedness, relationality and connectedness. Um, this has been delightful. I would love to not have the last word. Is there someone who, um, is there was someone who would love to close us out before I transfer us? Um, I mean, I'm happy to have the last word. I can just, my la the last word could be thank you, but Thomas, you look like you're about to say something, so go ahead. Um, I'd just like to say one thing. Uh, one thing I think that the Black church has given us is the fact that we can have religion and we can have a spirit that is soulful. I think one of the great it has been spirit, that which makes us human. It has been all about being moralistic or, and maybe too abstract. And uh, uh, the Black Church has taught us that we can be we can be spiritual and soulful at the same time. Those are two different things. So I wouldn't want to give that up for anything. Yeah. Thank you. 
Thank you everyone for your time. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Reggie. Thank you, Jerry Ann. And a shout out to all the people of South Church too. It's lovely to see many of you. And um, I will turn this over, I believe, Jerry Ann. Uh, I'm turning That's this me. over. Um, I'm next. Okay. Thank, thank you, you, Selena. Yes. Um, thank you, um, everyone, for attending today's Eleanor Williams Hooker um, Tea Talk series on race and um, the care of the soul. Um, I especially want to thank our presenters, um, Dr. Moore and Dr. Wilburn, and of course, um, Reverend Smith, for engaging us in this very important dialogue. Um, just some really quick reflections about our discussion today. Um, I really wanna start with um, Dr. Wilburn's um, uh, talk um, about how, you know, the art is restorative care of the mind and the body and the soul. And um, it just made me think about how art has been used to um, liberate black people, um, you know, through music, through song, through dance, through poetry, through fashion, and how different um, Black artists have used their uh, talents to really um, invite us into understanding um, what it is, you know, to 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 experience to be Black and female, or Black and and or gay and Black and you know uh, 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 trans or poor. And it also made me think of. Um, Ernie Barnes, um, African-American artist um, in the late 60s and 70s, and how he used his unique um, paintings and drawings to really ex invite people to understand and um, learn more about the beauty and the heart of ghetto life of Black people. And so, you know, what, it, what art can do to really help us express um, our our soul, our um, deepest being, right? And so, I I think it's 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 um, it's really important, as Reggie had expressed earlier. You know that we we look at art as not just something to experience and to be entertained by, but it's something that is lived and something to engage us. Um, and also, um, Doctor Doctor Moore talked about how you know um, how our soul is, is a way of connecting with each other, our humanity. And so even though we have our individual cultures and identities, which are very important, we don't wanna dismiss that, we don't wanna ignore that. Um, our soul is, is much deeper than our emotion and it, it is a way for us to see our humanity. And so me, you know, it makes me think of, you know, no matter if you are poor or a person of color or, you know, a descendant of an enslaved African, it doesn't negate or should uh, make anyone feel like they're less deserving of human dignity and respect. Um, you know, the soul is a sense of commonality of life with people. And I love some of those things that came up. And so it's our strong connection um, we have with others. It's the foundation of who we are. And so, um, you know, I had thought of um, Audre Lorde's, um, one of her quotes, um, it's not our differences that divide us. It is our inability to recognize and accept and celebrate those differences. And so even though our humanity is something that connects us, understanding that our differences are a gift and is what, it's, it's what defines us and, and, and it makes us who we are and we should always celebrate those things and honor those things. Um, and so, I, I, I think today's discussion was very necessary and important for us to continue to think about how um, we care um, for ourselves, for our soul, for each other. Um, and um, I hope we can continue to stay engaged in those dialogues. And I love Dr. Moore's um, suggestion that how food kind of brings us together and feeds the soul and stuff. So um, I, I think of always food as that common language that helps us to bring um, communities together um, and helps us to have these really thought provoking and provocative discussions, especially around race. Um, so thank you all again for attending um, this discussion. Um, before we close, I do wanna acknowledge um, the volunteers who have 
helped uh, with the technology for today and helped with promotion for today's event. Um, we always appreciate the time and energy our volunteers um, dedicate to the trail. Um, I also would like to thank our sponsor, the New Hampshire Humanities, uh, for uh, sponsoring this year's uh, Tea Talk series. Um, if you are really um, hungry for more information and really enjoy, enjoy today's discussion, um, please join us next week um, for our next um, Tea Talk, uh, which is titled, It Happened in New Hampshire, Black History in the Granite State. Please visit our website to register for next week's um, Tea Talk. And also, um, thank you for posting that. Um, and also, if you did enjoy today's event, please um, also consider making a donation to the trail of any size. Um, your contribution is what helps us to uh, continue to host um, these different programs um, throughout the year. So you can also visit our website um, to donate, as well as follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, and please share these um, events uh, with your followers and friends uh, via social media. Thank you again for joining us and um, enjoy the remainder of your day. <laughs>